Welcome to the uh, second installment of the Fields Postdoctoral Colloquium. And uh, today we have Margaret Nichols, who's going to tell us about surfaces in three manifolds and the Thurston norm. I, well, thank you for having me. Um, no one's sitting in the first row, so I don't have to give the splash zone warning. Um, you should all be safe. So, oh, can we get, I can teach you. Should be good now. All right, so um, the point of this talk is to basically hopefully convince you that it's worth studying surfaces in three manifolds, and in particular, they're a really uh, effective way of studying three manifolds. And I'll in particular tell you a bit about the Thurston norm. Um, so to start off, uh -oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to start off with just in case you don't think about three manifolds very often, which I don't, I guess I don't blame you if you don't. Uh, just give you a few concrete examples to keep in your head as we go through this talk. And I'll be coming back to these particular examples as well. So the first example I want to introduce is the idea of a mapping torus. Um, this is a three manifold that you build by taking your favorite surface, crossing it with an interval, and then gluing one end back to the start via your favorite homeomorphism of the surface. Um, so this gives you, you know, if you just take the identity map from your surface to itself, this is just giving you a product manifold, um, your surface cross the circle, but otherwise you're getting some sort of uh, more interesting three manifolds that, you know, depends in some way on this choice of homeomorphism. So here's a picture, a cartoon of how to build this. Um, and I don't know, this is a picture I keep in my head a lot. Um, the second class of examples that I want to um, have you stick in your heads is just not compliments. Is Margaret? Yeah. I pause you right away. Can you explain the name? Why is it called the mapping torus? Um, so this is a more sort of the idea is you're building it like you build a torus when you take us, you know, a circle across an interval and then glue the circle back up to itself. But this is a more general construction. Um, you can also call this uh, uh, just a surface bundle over the circle. Um, so it's just that you're doing a torus with a mapping. Yeah. Phi being the map. Well, yeah. Okay. Is this not, we're not supposed to be thinking about a globe or something like that. So, some uh, kind of no, I mean, so, so you can take any surface. It doesn't have to be a torus. It can have multiple holes. Um, higher genus, or you can take a sphere across. You're not going to have many interesting homeomorphisms there, but um, yeah. Okay. Is that, okay. Um, so the second class of examples, not complements, you know, take a knot in S3, take it out of S3, you're left with a three manifold that, depending on whether you're removing the knot or a neighborhood of the knot, is either a, a open three manifold, so it's not compact, or it's uh, compact with a boundary, with torus boundary. Um, so, so here's my the simplest interesting knot, which is the trefoil knot. Um, and then here's a much more complicated knot, except it's actually secretly the unknot. So these are really interesting manifolds, but also, you know, this, this second drawing hopefully gives you the idea that you know, even though they seem very natural, they, they're not necessarily the easiest to get your hands on and actually tell what manifold you're working with. Yes. What's the definition of a three manifold? A three, <laughs> okay. Uh, a three manifold is just a topological space that locally looks like R3. Ah, okay. All right, so these are our examples. So, Okay, I've given you some some three manifolds to think about. Why should we care about studying surfaces within this? So a surface is just a two-dimensional manifold. Every point has a neighborhood that looks like R2. Um, so these, you know, in general, if I say I have a surface, I'm saying, you know, a map of a surface into my three manifolds. I'm gonna hope that, you know, say this map is continuous. Uh, 
to, to be able to work with something there, but we have no reason a priori to expect that this map, you know, that this surface looks like anything reasonable within the three manifolds. Um, but just to get things started for motivation here, um, I want to say surfaces are, are much easier to just understand. Um, in a first course in topology, you probably write down just, you know, complete classification of surfaces. Um, so a surface is determined up to homeomorphism by the number, its genus, so the number of holes it has, the number of boundary components it has, and the number of punctures it has. That's sort of all you can do topologically to get to affect your surface. You can add more holes, uh, cut out some disks to add more boundary components, poke some holes to add punctures. Um, but otherwise, once you name these three numbers, that's all you can do. Moreover, the geometry of the surface is completely determined by um, its topology. The, the Euler characteristic, which is this expression that I've written down, um, the Euler characteristic completely determines whether the surface admits spherical geometry, uh, flat geometry, R2 geometry, or hyperbolic geometry. And that's entirely based on whether this number that I've written down is greater than zero for spherical geometry, zero for flat geometry, or negative for hyperbolic geometry. So really, like this is this is all of surface topology. Um, I have another question. Yeah. What's the difference between a hole and a puncture? Uh, it's whether you are so puncture. You're you have then an open manifold. Um, and if you just if you cut out your uh, if you have a boundary component, that's leaving you a, a manifold with boundary. I see. It's a minor difference, and usually it's not paid a lot of attention to. Okay, I just never had never heard of punctures before. So this is a little, I've never heard the Euler characteristic written down like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, for most purposes, um, they're interchangeable. Okay. Okay. So we have we have nice geometry to work with. Uh, nice topology to work with. These are also within our three manifold, their co-dimension one. I think this is a pervasive theme throughout math that co-dimension one is good. That sort of gives us the most leverage towards the entire space, the entire object that we're working with. Here's where things get a little bit more interesting and more unique to three manifolds. If we look at homology, the second homology of our three manifolds, we can, you know, you think of this as being represented by some surface in your three manifolds, hence why I'm talking about it here, but you can always find an embedded representative. So no matter what continuous map you pick of your surface into your three manifolds, that might not be embedded, but you can find a homologous surface that is embedded. Um, and I'm not going to go through exactly how you do this. This is just sort of one line on this slide. But the idea is you can do some sort of cut and paste surgery to modify where you have intersection curves um, to replace your surface with something embedded. And that cut and paste isn't changing the homology class. All right. And then also, one great thing about three manifolds is a lot of um, sort of properties that you see sort of homotopically speaking, you can actually promote to saying something more geometric, more about actual embedded surfaces. So for instance, the sphere theorem says that if you have non-trivial pi two, so there's some map of a sphere, uh, some non-null homotopic map of a sphere into your three manifold, you can actually find uh, an embedded sphere that is still non-trivial in pi two. In particular, then you can modify that to get a separating sphere. Um, so this lets you realize your three manifold as a connect sum of two simpler three manifolds. Um, yeah. Uh, no, in general, this is just a, you know, pi two is saying just some map of a sphere into, 
into your manifold. Sorry? No, not, ne not necessarily. Um, right, so this, so this is saying that we have a way of promoting some homotopical data about pi two into actually cutting your manifolds into simpler pieces. Um, so we call this sort of sphere reducing sphere. And if your um, if your three manifold has trivial pi two, that means that it can't, it doesn't have any reducing spheres, and you can't cut it into any simpler pieces. Um, and we call that an irreducible manifold. So, so just say again. The reducing sphere is simply this embedded sphere that you get from non-trivial pi two. So it lets you realize your three manifold as a connect sum of two simpler three manifolds. So you're just gluing it along this ball or along this sphere. Uh -huh. So Knazer's lemma, I won't get into sort of specifically what it's saying, but it's it's a similar sort of promoting um, data about pi one now into actually giving you something concrete to work with and play with in your three manifold. If you so if you, you have your map of the surface into your three manifold, if the map on pi one has a kernel, that means there's some loop in uh, S that gets killed in M. It homotopically bounds a disk in M. This actually says that you can find an embedded disk uh, with boundary in S um, inside of M. And so this is what's called the compressing disk. You can do some sort of cut and paste along this disk to essentially simplify your map of your surface. You're getting a new surface, but it's homologous to the one that you started with. So again, if we're sort of only looking, if we only care about restricting to homologous surfaces, to a single homology class, uh, this is saying, okay, we can, we can you know, get an embedded representative and then we can you know, cut it down, find, find as many ways to simplify it as possible to get the simplest surface representing this homology class. Okay. Um, so that's, that's what I was saying here. That's what I mean by an incompressible representative of a homology class. It's just, you take your surface, you, you take your map in, you embed it, you, you modify it so that it's embedded, and then you modify it so that you get rid of any, so that incompressible you should think of as being pi one injective. All right, so now that we have these sort of topological tools, we can use these nice representative embedded surfaces of homology classes to actually further simplify our three manifold M. So I said we could cut along these reducing spheres, um, to cut your three manifold into these irreducible pieces. So this is really a prime factorization in a, in a very literal sense. Um, it's unique up to permutation of your pieces, et cetera. Um, you can also cut along certain incompressible surfaces to get, to get three manifolds with boundary, but that are in some sense smaller than what you started with. And in particular, there's um, what is called the JSJ decomposition, which is a choosing a collection of um, incompressible tori to cut along in your three manifolds. And this great theorem of Thurston and Perlman, because it uses the Poincare conjecture, says that if you do this, if you cut along this JSJ decomposition, you get a bunch of pieces that each carries one of the eight sort of homogeneous three-dimensional geometries. So in two dimensions, there are three homogeneous geometries. They're spherical, flat, and hyperbolic. In three dimensions, you get, uh, there are exactly eight of these. They're sort of have a certain, a good amount of symmetry to them. Um, these are sort of the model geometries. Um, and these geometries are listed here. Um, and the sort of one, one takeaway from this theorem is really that most 
of these pieces. And so in some sense, most three manifolds carry a hyperbolic structure. They're hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, so that's why you see a lot of work in hyperbolic three manifolds, because that's sort of the simultaneously the generic case and also the hardest case. All right, so this is our motivation. Um, so this is, this is telling us that uh, using surfaces, we can get this very rich structure um, to our three manifolds. So hopefully that is some good motivation. Um, let's go back to our examples and think about the surfaces that exist in our, in our examples. Um, so in the mapping torus example, um, well, we have this surface S that we're handed that we know is embedded. Um, well, S cross, you know, whichever point in the interval you like. Um, so in fact, we can read off of based on this surface, well, really based on this homo homeomorphism um, of the surface, we can completely classify the geometry of the mapping torus. So there's sort of three things that can happen. You can have a, homeo uh, a homeomorphism that's a finite order. And really this is, as I say, isotopic to a homeomorphism of finite order. The homeomorphism type uh, of the three manifold doesn't depend on the isotopy class of the homeomorphism. What was your question? Yeah. What is the isotopic? Uh, so it's like a homotopy, but you're sort of a uh, homeomorphism all along the way. Okay. Um, so you can be finite order, kind of boring. You can be reducible, which just means that there's some collection of simple closed curves. That's what the SCC is. So these are curves that don't intersect themselves. Um, simple closed curves that are, as a collection, fixed by the homeomorphism. Um, and I'll come back to you in a moment why this is called reducible. Um, the third case is that your homeomorphism, if it's not one of these previous two things, it's pseudo Anasov which is sort of a generalization of Nasov, which is basically the idea is that you're mixing, th this homeomorphism mixes everything up, up on the surface. There's sort of uh, locally two different directions that this homeomorphism is sort of moving things around. There's an expanding direction and a contracting direction. Um, and so this gives you really interesting dynamics on your surface and well, it mixes everything up. Sorry, what is SCC? Simple closed curve. It's yeah, much shorter than writing that out, but also I recognize that this is not an audience that would know that sort of standard abbreviation. Um, okay, so what does this mean? So if we have a finite order um, homeomorphism, then this means that our mapping torus has a finite cover where our homeomorphism is actually just the identity. Take, you know, if, you're, if your homeomorphism is of order n, take this n-fold um, cover and your, and your home, now your, your mapping torus is cover just looks like a product, a circle across s. Um, and so from that, you can sort of knowing that your surface well we're assuming that we're working with a um hyper uh, with a hyperbolic surface here that has hyperbolic geometry uh and then the, the sort of circle direction gives you the cross r geometry um, in the case of re a reducible homeomorphism you have this collection of curves that are sort of mixed around by the homeomorphism but ultimately, if you sort of track these curves through the product portion and then where it maps, and then through the product portion and then where that curve maps, eventually these, by this assumption, these will all link up. So you'll get a bunch of these turn out to be incompressible tori within your three manifold. And so this is going back to when you're discussing the motivation, um, this gives you a way of decomposing your three manifold further using this JSJ decomposition. Um, so you can simplify the three manifold in this, uh, in this way and get 
some simpler fuses that then you can analyze on their own. And then this third case mixes everything up. Um, Thurston shows that in this case, you actually get hyperbolic, a hyperbolic three manifold. So this classification is, is really saying, we understand what's going on if we have, if we have a mapping torus. Yes? Um, it's not, and, and they're not. So one and two, or A and B, can happen simultaneously, um, but C can't happen with either of those. Um, yeah, if you, have, if you have hyperbolic geometry, you can't have any incompressible tori, um, and you can't carry multiple of these geometries at once, so you can't have hyperbolic geometry and H2 cross R geometry. Um, so yeah, so this is saying we understand what's happening when we have a mapping torus. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm saying that you can, in a sense, yes, there's a, you can put this sort of geometry on it. You can describe, a, you know, a metric on your manifold that has this geometry. That then lifts to yeah. When you lift to the universal cover, I mean these these universal covers will be homeomorphic. It's really about the the metric that you're looking at. Okay, um, and I just want to make a comment uh, that it, this sort of manifold we call a fibered three manifold um, because it's a surface bundle over the circle with fiber your surface. Um, so if you see fibered three manifold, it really means fibered over the circle with surface fibers. All right. Just check on. All right, we're whizzing through the time here, so we'll see. This goes. Um, so that was that was uh, that was mapping to array, our first example, class of examples not complements, we can similarly classify. Um, there's sort of three different things that can happen with a knot, um, three different behaviors you can see. And this sort of mirrors, in some ways sort of mirrors the class, the Nielsen-Thurston classification that we just saw. Um, this will become clear in a moment. So the first thing that can happen is that um, your knot embeds in a standard torus. So again, this is the trefoil knot. Um, you can sort of imagine uh, your inner circle of your torus is here, your outer circle of your torus is here, and this just sort of loops around up and under, up and under. Um, so this is an example of a torus knot. I didn't write that in here yet. Um, the second thing that can happen is that, so, so for the first case, that has to be on a standard torus. It's not sort of, it's just sitting in R3 the way that you imagine a torus. Um, the second thing that can happen is that your knot lies inside a solid torus, so fill in your torus. You now have a donut, except you're tying up your donut. You want a knotted solid torus. Um, you've tied that up into some sort of knot, and then your, your knot lies inside of it. Um, and you want to exclude silly things like, you know, you don't want it to just, this could sit inside a knotted solid torus, where just it doesn't go to part of the torus. You want to make sure that you're actually going through the entire torus. Um, so this is a picture. This is a good picture to keep in mind. Um, you've sort of got your your phantom trefoil knot sort of drawn in there, but the in, what's inside is really the knot you care about. And then the third thing that can happen is that the knot complement is hyperbolic. And this one is an exclusive or. Um, so as I sort of was saying, this first case is called a torus knot because it sits on a torus. The second case is called a hyperbolic knot, or sorry, a satellite knot, um, because it's sort of orbiting this phantom knot, um, the solid torus, knotted solid torus that it's sitting inside. And then the third one is a hyperbolic knot.
So again, we've got this sort of understanding of there are three different things that can happen. Um, and you know, maybe the first two are a little bit easier to understand because you have more structure. You're not just saying, oh, case three is sort of everything else and you're not hyperbolic. So that's nice that you know you have that structure, but it's not telling you much about what the knot looks like. Whereas in the first two cases, you have this very precise description of where you have at least more structure of you're lying on a torus or you're you know, sort of orbiting this other knot. Um, okay, so just a quick theorem that I want to mention um, is that this is not obvious, but the knot complement, the three manifold we're studying when we're studying knots, is actually determined by the knot. So if you have two knots that are not sort of ambiently isotopic in S3 or in R3, they're not actually, they're, they're, um, complements are not homeomorphic. And this is not true for links. There are actually, you know, distinct links. So links are just knots with multiple components, distinct links that have uh, homeomorphic complements. Okay, so this is telling us, that I, I read this theorem as to study knot complements somehow boils down to studying the knots themselves, right? Um, but distinguishing two knots is hard. There's sort of, if you've played around with doing any baby knot theory, you learn like there are these sort of, if you're working with a knot projection, there are these three moves you can do that in principle do let you get between any two projections of the same knot, but actually figuring out how to do that is a nightmare. Um, so this is where we start thinking about knot invariants, which are, just you know, some data that we can attach to a knot that we can read off of a knot, and we can compare two different knots this way and see, okay, well, if this knot invariant disagrees for these two knots, they're not the same knot. There's no way I can isotope them to get the same projection. Um, and surfaces start to pop up when we're starting to define some of these um, knot invariants. So here's a fun table of, um, how to tell whether or not your knot is something very basic. So what does it mean for your knot to be the unknot? The unknot is just the unknotted knot. Uh, <laughs> this means that it bounds a disk. It bounds an embedded disk in, in the knot complement. So the disk has the unknot as its boundary and otherwise doesn't intersect the knot at all. All right, so B2, that's a surface. Um, so an unlink is, well, um, I guess you can think about, uh, I maybe wanted to write, you can think about unlink, that's just, you know, you have multiple unknot components that aren't, that you can separate apart. In particular, you have some sphere that you can sort of grab one component with, and the other components are sitting outside of that. Um, you can also use this sphere to say, if I have a link that, you know, I'm, I'm forgetting the, the precise term for this right now, but it's sort of, it's a split link, I think is the term where you can, where it's not sort of interlinked with itself at all. You have some, I'm using the word essential to mean that it's not null homotopic. So you have an essential sphere here. Um, a composite knot is one that you, there's this knot operation of taking the connect sum of two knots. Um, so here's an example of a composite knot. And basically you have two knots and then you're just taking this band connecting an arc between them. And uh, if you have a composite knot, that means that you have an essential sphere in S3 that meets your knot in exactly two points. So for instance, I could take the sphere that sort of wraps around like this and intersects in these two points. Um, Isn't every knot a composite knot? Uh, so, is by, so, so the essential here yeah. means that, you know, I can't just take this sphere here 
it needs to actually, it can't be um, sort of parallel to the knot, right? If I took this sphere here, I could just sort of shrink it down to be a tube that runs along the knot. So that's what essential means here. Um, is sort of a word that means different things in different contexts, but is ultimately very useful because it means is not doing something dumb. Um, so our satellite knot, this was one that lived inside this other phantom knot. Um, that other phantom knot that had to be knotted up, actually, not the unknot, that gives us, the boundary of that gave us this incompressible torus. And essential meaning that, again, it's not, it's not um, parallel to the knot itself. All right, so this is a bunch of just ways that you can start to use surfaces to determine what type of knot you have. Um, let's think about this first one, though. Um, if, you're, if you have the unknot, that means you bound a disk. Okay, so if your knot is actually knotted, it doesn't bound a disk. So we can ask, what is the simplest surface that K actually bounds? So we're asking, um, let's look at, we want to think about embedded surfaces where the interior of the surface is embedded in the knot complement and the boundary is exactly the knot. Um, and by simplest, I mean, you know, generally speaking, this means, you know, few, lowest genus, fewest punctures. We mean in terms of the Euler characteristic that I wrote on the first slide. Um, so this sort of surface that's bounded by K is what we call a cypher surface. And then we want this to always be an orientable surface. And then here's our first, here's our first knot invariant is the knot genus, which is simply the minimum genus or the minimum Euler characteristic. Um, these will sort of line up because we have a single boundary component. Um, the knot genus is just measuring the minimum genus among cypher surfaces for that knot. So, okay, if you're the unknot, your knot genus is zero. Otherwise, it's something positive. Um, so how do we get cypher surfaces? This is a sketch uh, that doesn't necessarily need to mean anything, but it, the point is that Seifert's algorithm gives a really just straightforward, really easy to write down and apply um, and build cypher surfaces. You're, you're um, finding a bunch of disks and then you're connecting the disks wherever you have a crossing, you're just adding in this sort of twisted band. Um, and this gives just a simple algorithm for constructing cypher surfaces. So you at least have something to start working with. Um, but I think it's actually more interesting to think about um, cipher surfaces homologically. So if we think about the homology of a knot complement, if you go back to algebraic topology, you can compute this using Meyer Viatoris um, and see that no matter what your knot is, H1 is the integers, is just Z. And this is generated by just a loop, a meridional loop, so a loop that goes around your knot, just the little segment of your knot. Um, so this tells us, using some Poincaré duality and whatnot, uh, that h lower to you is also just z. So any, if we, any, any representative of a generator of the second homology can be represented by an embedded surface in, um, in the knot complement that intersects this meridional loop exactly once, that's going to be a cipher surface. And in particular, this tells us that all of our cipher surfaces are homologous, or all of the cipher surfaces corresponding to our choice of generator. You know, there's a, there's a choice of um, orientation there. Maybe I'll just leave this up for a second and then move on. So um, we're starting to think about surfaces within a, within a given homology class. Um, 
which was sort of what we were talking about at the beginning with the motivation of, you know, we seem to get all of this leverage if we don't worry too much about which specific surface we're working with and just focus on a homology class. So here we're doing that and we're saying, oh, hey, all of our cipher surfaces are living in the same homology class. So they're all related um, in this way. Okay, so not genus is really a lead in the baby case of sort of the main point, uh, the second part of the title of my talk, talking about Thurston norm. So the Thurston norm is a norm on the second homology of a manifold, if it has boundary relative to a boundary. Um, and it's defined with, over homology with real coefficients, but we're going to start off just defining it over integral co coefficients. So we pick a surface in our three manifolds. Don't worry too much about the boundary that's here. Um, but we define this negative Euler characteristic. It's basically the negative of the Euler characteristic, except if our Euler characteristic was positive, we just treat it as zero. Um, that's if our surface is connected, if our surface is disconnected, we just take the sum of the individual, of the components or the characteristics. Um, and then the Thurston norm says, let's look at a particular, to start, let's look at a particular integral homology class. And we're going to look at all of the representatives of this homology class. And we're going to minimize over this negative, um, negative Thurston norm, or the, sorry, this negative Euler characteristic. Um, so we're going to find, this is saying we want, this is measuring what is the simplest representative, topologically representative of this homology class. Just like we were saying with the not genus is sort of measuring what is the simplest cipher surface. But here, this is generalizing to, you know, not just looking at, uh, you know, rank one homology. Why hey. does this minimum exist? Sorry? Why does the minimum exist? Why does the um, because you're looking at uh, integral values, right? Your, your, your Euler characteristic is always an integer and it's, you know, bounded below by zero. Um, so in general, or characteristic okay, okay. is okay. like, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so how do you extend this to uh, real coefficients? Well, first you extend it to rational coefficients by saying, you know, this should be, this should be linear on rays. If I take, you know, a scalar multiple of a homology class, I should be scaling, scaling the Thurston norm by that amount. Um, and then I want it to be, I want it to be uh, sort of behave well with linear combinations. Um, so that lets you extend to rational coefficients. And then you say, I want this norm to be continuous you can extend to real coefficients. Okay, and this is what I was saying. The, the baby example of this is looking at a surface and the, and the um, not genus is, you know, you're not quite measuring the same thing here. You're measuring Euler characteristic as opposed to genus of the surface, but those are, those are related. Um, okay. So I wanted to do an actual example where we do something a little bit more complicated than a not um, to actually see, compute this Thurston norm, figure out what it is. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of drawing on the board because I couldn't do this all in pictures. But this is the white head link. So it's a pretty simple link, but it's, it has two components. Um, and so the homology isn't just Z anymore. Um, so I've, I've labeled the curves here, A and B, you should think of, um, A and B can, you, you can think of them as little loops that go around, um, each of the, each of the two curves. And then 
your homology is generated by surfaces that intersect one of these curves one. Um, so let me, let me, I'll do this over here. I think this will be easier to see. Um, so I want to find uh, I want to find not a ciphered surface for this. I want to find representatives of these two of each of these two homology classes, which is to say, I want to find a for A, I want to find a surface that is bounded by A and doesn't intersect the B loop at all. So it'll have a single boundary component and it'll be, so this is A, nope. The sort of un, what looks like an unknotted component is A and the other one is B, the sort of figure eight looking thing is B. So if I want to find a surface A bounds, this starts to become a little bit of a game of visualization, um, which gets easier with practice. But let me see if I can do a reasonable job here. So if I ignore B completely, my A component is just a circle, an unknotted circle that bounds a disk. So um, Let me try and that that's not gonna, it's not gonna work well. So I can try and shade this disk in, but I start to run into problems because my B loop crashes through this disk. So it crashes through in two places. This part, this other arc here, um, just goes over it the entire way. So I don't need to worry about that arc. Um, But I do need to worry about these two places my B arc crashes through this disk because I don't want my surface that A is bounding to intersect B at all. So how can I avoid B here? I'm just going to, instead of crashing through, I'm going to add this little tube that goes around this arc. So what I've got is I basically got a disc with this tube glued on. Is that, can people see that, how I've done that? Uh, all right, so that's, well, that's telling you that the, that the, this is giving you an upper bound on the Thurston norm of A, but it shouldn't be too hard to convince yourself that this doesn't actually bound a disk. And so you're not gonna get anything low, you're not going to get anything simpler than this. The only thing simpler than your genus one surface is a genus zero surface. Um, so this is uh, genus one, which is to say, the Euler characteristic or the negative Euler characteristic uh, is also one. And you can play a similar game and try and build a surface for B. Another, um, I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to skip that and instead say, you can also fiddle around with this not projection and actually switch A and B. Just do some basic moves to this projection and get the same picture, except your, your A loop has traded places with your B loop. Um, and so that should convince you that, that the first norm for both of those is the same. Okay. What if we wanted to compute the first norm of some homology class like this? You know, something crazy. Um, that's going to be a lot more work than drawing a picture like this and trying to, you know, sort out what's going on. This is where the structure of the Thurston norm uh, comes into, you know, becomes very helpful. So Thurston proved, you know, not only 
because this norm exists, but this norm has this, these really nice properties. So if you look at the, the unit ball, um, so the, the, you know, homology classes with Thurston norm one, um, or at most one, this forms a convex rational polyhedron. It's symmetric about the origin because if you take negative homology class, that'll have the same Thurston norm as before. And the, the vertices of this polyhedron are lattice points. So they're, they're integral lattice points. Um, so what does this mean? I have another question. So yeah. are, we, are we thinking of A and B here still as these knots in the picture of the whitehead link? Or more generally? Um, yeah, I'm sort of abusing notation and using them to simultaneously refer to these uh, components of the link and also as generators for the homology here. Yeah, because I, I guess um, I, I didn't understand what, what 3a plus 16b means. Uh, so if you're, if you're thinking of your homology as being, you know, generated by, it's z2, if you think of the generators as a and b, then 3a plus 16b is another homology class. Okay. Um, so what does the Thurston norm unit ball look like for the whitehead link? Um, it, looks, it looks like this picture up here. Um, you know, we know the sort of uh, vertices that are shown from this calculation of the Thurston norm of A and B that also gives you negative A and negative B. Um, and then you know that this is, you know that you're, whatever you're getting has to be a convex polyhedron. Um, so it's enough to check a single point um, between, like on each face and see that it's actually on that face and not sort of further out. Um, and so this, I won't do this calculation, but you can calculate that A plus B, maybe I will sort of, uh, so A plus B lies, well, A plus B lies out here. You calculate that the first norm is two, that tells you that, okay, half of that lies exactly on this line segment here. So that's telling you that this is actually a flat face and not something bulging out like this. And similarly for A minus B. Um, so this is just, this is just illustrating this point here. So this is what in this case, our Thurston norm ball looks like. It's just a, it's just a diamond. Um, and if we restrict to one of these faces, so by a face, I mean, you know, it can be a top dimensional face. Here, I'm also gonna think of like the vertices as faces. I can consider my lower dimensional faces as faces as well. Um, if I restrict to a face, my Thurston norm is additive there. It's not necessarily additive if I'm looking at a class over here and a class over here. Uh, and this tells us that we can easily compute the Thurston norm of 3a plus 16b. It's just 19. All right, so the Thurston norm also has some other very useful properties. So we, so we can talk about a fiber homology class, um, which is to say this is a homology class that has a representative that uh, is a fiber of M fibering over the circle. Um, so it, this is a surface, this is a, a representative surface where M is a mapping torus with that surface. Um, so as I said before, these are fibered, a mapping torus is a fibered manifold. Um, and so this is, we can, we can discuss these fibered faces or these fibered classes as just saying this is this is a fibered class is just a way of your three manifold fibering. And Thurston proves that this, there's this really strong property that if you're looking at a given face of 
your Thurston ball, if you look at the interior of it, and you look at any integral homology class that sort of lies in the cone over that, so maybe I could have made a better picture here, illustrating that with something really strong holds. Either every class is fibered or none of them are. Um, so this is just illustrating that face. It turns out that um, these are what we call fibered faces. In, the, in our example of the whitehead link, um, the top dimensional faces, so the you know, one dimensional faces are fibered. But the, the so, so any integral homology class that doesn't lie on one of the axes represents a fibered class. But the axes don't. Um, I realize I'm it's almost one o'clock now. We started a few minutes late. Um, so hopefully I can get through the rest of this without rushing too much. Um, Okay, so here's the basic question. We, have, we know that our Thurston norm ball has this remarkable property that, you know, fibered classes, when they show up, they show up in force. Uh, so we can ask when, when does the Thurston norm ball have a fibered base? Basic question. This is the same as asking, you know, if you're looking at a knot, if it has, because the, the homology is just Z, your, your Thurston norm ball isn't going to be two dimensional, it's just going to be one dimensional. And that's just asking when is, you know, that one homology class generator actually fibered? When is your knot fibered? Um, okay, so I'm getting to the punchline of this talk. So virtual fibering, uh, what does it mean for, to have a virtual property? for a manifold to have a virtual property. Uh, you say that a manifold is virtually whatever, if it has some finite cover that has that property. Uh, so we can ask, it's natural to ask, how does the Thurston norm behave undertaking finite covers? Um, these virtual properties are of, of, of a lot of interest because they, you know, it's often difficult to get your hands on property is actual manifolds, but if you can find some finite cover that has that property and you know what this finite cover is, you can, you can relate, you can use that upstairs information and structure to study your downstairs manifolds a lot better. Um, so it's, it's not at all clear how this Thurston norm behaves under um, undertaking a finite cover. Not all homology classes lift. Um, if you do have a class that lifts, that may it may decrease in norm. They're going to get new homology potentially, and so new faces. However, here is uh, another version of this question. When does the Thurston norm ball of some finite cover of M have a fibroid face? And the answer is always. So this is this theorem of Eagle and Rise is the virtual fibering theorem, one of the sort of biggest results in the past decade in three manifold topology. You know, this is the statement of the theorem, but this is basically saying, answering this previous question with a yes. You're just asking some basic question about the Thurston norm. Um, how does it, how does the Thurston norm behave under taking finite covers? Can you always find a finite cover where you're getting one of these nice fibroid faces showing up? Um, so I think I am just perfectly out of time here. Um, so I will stop here. Thank you all. Oh, well, thank you very much. And let me uh, ask for questions. Some doubts like uh, the, the last here, like for example, if the S satisfies the domain conditions, then there's a way to found the, 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 the,
Right. So the answer is no. This is sort of so uh, this theorem was sort of fully proved in 2012. And since then, there's been this huge shift in three manifold topology of going from trying to prove results like this to trying to prove things that are much more quantitative, much more putting concrete bounds on how bad these things can be. Because the answer is this, the proof of this is a mess. It's long, it's complicated. It goes deeply through geometric group theory and leaves you with no sense of what the, the index, like how bad this cover is, how big this cover is. Um, and the construction is really actually like probably gratuitously bad. That was quite a condemn condemnatory statement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an import, incredibly important statement, but at the same time, you know, it's kind of disappointing when you come across some interesting result and then realize it's sitting on the shoulders of virtual fibering or, some, or you know, one of these related results where you don't actually have your hands on anything. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, let's thank Margaret again for a very nice talk. Thank you.